I forgot to turn my screen recorder on again. So people who tune in later are going to be in chapter two of first John and wonder what happened to uh, the first chapter here that went by so quick. <laughs> we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. Well, if there's anything that John conveyed to us about that last time that Jesus was with his disciples, he was adamant that, you know, if you love me, you will, you will obey, you know, my command. Uh, it, when he gave that last and final call to them to love one another, just as I have loved you, he said, this is a command I give you. Uh, not that we need to be commanded, but we're, we're pretty hard headed people. And uh, sometimes somebody has to shake a finger at us and say, you do that. <laughs> That's important. Uh, please. Uh, so we know that we've come to know him if we obey his command. So in other words, we're doing as he has asked us to do. Uh, if we don't know Jesus, we're not going to pay any attention uh, to his commands. But those who know him know how grievous it is when, when we don't obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Well, that's pretty clear stuff there, too. I mean, but at least he gives us a little proof here. He says there are going to be people who say, boy, I know Jesus, but their words and their actions are far from somebody who really knows the Lord. They're, as he says, they're a liar. But if anyone obeys the word, his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. Okay. Well, I, I want to, I want to stop and camp on that verse for just, just one second. Anyway, just obeying God does not make God's love complete in us. Uh, you've heard me say before, there's, there's two modes of serving we, we, can, we can act like a slave who is forced to do things against their will. Now, that, that isn't done because of love. That's done because of fear, right? I mean, or fear of punishment. I mean, it all goes together. I mean, that is someone who, who is under a servitude. Uh, they, they, they are compelled to do it against their will. Now, that doesn't come from love. But when we understand what God wants of us, we become obedient to his commands and we do it because we know it is going to bless us and it's going to bless others. Then God's love is at, at work within us. That's servanthood. That's, that's that other mode of living out our lives. And, and so when John says, if, if anybody obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. He's talking about that latter case that I just made about servanthood because we did it because we know God and we know God's love and we know that that is, that is going to bless and, and that's going to give us joy. But if, but if we're somehow or another, just making little check marks, trying to say, yep, I was good that day. And I did that. And I did that. Well, that's, that's not getting us to heaven. That's, that's that slavery again. We're doing it out of guilt. We're doing it out of fear. That's no way to live at all that's not going to give you a satisfied life or any joy in it. Uh, I, I, I went to a funeral service one time for somebody who uh, had been working with me and uh, they had been a part of the Jehovah's witness. Uh, I don't know what you want to call that. I don't know that they even call themselves a church, but out of that movement and, and that preacher went on for about an hour and 15 or 20 minutes and he had a long list and he was reading all the things that that person had done that were good in their life, trying to prove that God was going to admit them somehow or another into heaven based on all their good works. Well, you know, that's great if somebody would keep track of all the good things that you had done. But if you're having to make a list of them to think somehow or another, one day somebody's going to read that list to prove that you, you really did love God it may or may not have been love. It might've just been fear of punishment. It might've just been out of, out of uh, guilt for how much sin had accumulated in their life. It's there, there's a, that's, that's under the chains of our old master. When we, when we live like that, 
uh, that that is slavery, and and we can't have that in our life. I'm sorry to camp so long on that, but I think so many people just don't understand what John is saying here. It seems pretty simple, but sometimes it's misconstrued. Verse six, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. That goes without saying. I mean, how did Jesus walk? I mean, how, what was his mode of living? Well, he lived to serve and, and he loved serving God. Uh, he knew God. He was in fellowship with God. It's like Buster Bear Hill is coming in under the wire here. Hello, Buster. Hello, Jim. Howdy. We're in First John chapter two. Hey, hey, Buster. Hello. Whoop, lost you. First John chapter two, and we're finding ourselves at down to verse seven. Right, give me a second and I'll find it. All right. We're, we're just kind of camping slow on some of these verses because John packs a lot of information in a very short number of verses right here. In verse seven, he says, dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. Okay. This gets us wondering, okay, well, what's What's this thing he's going to tell us and remind us of, but it's, it's been told us before, but maybe we've forgotten it. He says, this old command is the message you have heard. Verse eight, yet I am writing you a new commandment. It's truth is seen in him and you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Now that's a big buildup to tell us something there. He hadn't really, he hadn't told us what it is yet. He, he's referring back to this light that shines in the darkness. Uh, and he talks about truth. He's, he's kind of salting our, the mind here, so to speak, so that we're going to be able to uh, find some nuggets here real quick. Verse nine, anyone who claims to be in the light, but hates his brother is still in the darkness. All right. So what's the command? It's the same command Jesus gave him before he left. Love one another even as I have loved you, right? A new command. Well, it was a new one when Jesus gave it, but it, it was an old one. He's not, he's not uh, making anything up here. So you, if you claim to be in the light, but you're hating your brother, you're still in the darkness. And boy, is there ever a lot of hate going on lately? All you got to do is bring up the word... Uh, Trump or Biden, and you see fire. <laughs> you see fire back there being stoked. <laughs> uh, folks, I'm going to tell you, uh, whether we get Biden or whether we get Trump, God's still going to be in charge one way or another. Uh, nothing's going to be done against God's will. Uh, there, people can rail and go up and down and do, do wrong things, but, uh, you know, it, it's still up to us to recognize the truth and do what's right uh, on an everyday basis. And, and if we will do that, we will have a great nation and, and we won't be led by people who uh, do the wrong things. Uh, I'm, I'm going to quit preaching on uh, who's, who's in charge here because God's in charge all the time. Uh, Jim, what verse are we on? Well, uh, let's see. All right. Uh, we were on verse nine and 10. They're just, it, I got, I was getting off the track, Buster verses nine and 10. We're at verse 10. I'm going to read verse 10 over. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. All right. Now, what is the light? John's using a lot of, a lot of words here that he, he has a lot packed into. So how would you describe the light? What, what's this light that he's talking about that, that Jesus has brought and shown into the world? What, what is that light? Love. Okay. That's one word. What's, what's another? Uh, 
nobody likes to be wrong so they're not going to say anything <laughs> okay it, well love love is a good definition for that light uh jesus well jesus was was the embodiment of that love all of that light he he spoke the truth that's another way to talk about light it's the truth if if you know the truth you you know you're going you're going to come into more truth and you're going to put the lies behind you. Uh, you know, we don't live in hate. We live in love. It's part of that light as well. I mean, it's, it's what we've seen in Jesus, who is the Christ. It, it draws other people who love God in as well. So verse 11, whoever, but whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. All right, this all fits really well with where he has just come from because the light is truth and love and hate is just the opposite of it, right? That's that darkness. That's that blindness that won't let you see uh, what, is, what is right. Uh, okay, that's probably enough. Verse 12. Now, now he's going to repeat a few things over and over in different ways for us here, and starting in verse 12. He's already called us children once. He's going to do it again. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Well, who are the, who are the children of God? One who believes. Right. I mean, if you, if you believe... In the name of the one that the Father has sent, I mean, you you are uh, a part with God and in God's family. You're his children, uh, and your sins have been forgiven on account of Jesus' name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. Now, when he says fathers, who do you think he's talking to here? I mean, he's, he's talking to people men that, have, huh? Men with children. Well, sure. I mean, he's, and specifically, I think he's talking to the elders of the church, the people who have lived through some hard times and bad times and things and, okay. and know what the truth is. Uh, and, and they're taking care of the children. I write to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. He doesn't give any qualifications to that, but they obviously, these, he's writing to people who are of faith, who have believed the message that has been preached. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. All right. Again, this goes back to that whole idea that John's been cooking up here in chapter one and two about I and the Father are one and you will be one with me, and uh, this, this idea has all, all these uh, things in it because we are, are one with the Father. We have the Holy Spirit. We accept the word that uh, speaks truth to us. So uh, I write to you, dear, dear children, because you have known the Father, I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. Okay. Now, I don't know specifically that he is talking about people who have met Jesus Christ, uh, because I'm thinking that by the time John is writing these words, there aren't very many original witnesses of Jesus. But he's talking to people that have come to faith, who have believed the firsthand witness of those who did see Jesus face to face. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. That, that's the second time he's talked about overcoming the evil one. I mean, how do we, how do we overcome the evil one? I'm doing what the Lord Jesus has told us to do. Well, yeah, there, I mean, he, you could just, you could just do a regurgitation of all these things that John has been talking about here. 
I mean, we obey his commands. We have love in our hearts. Uh, we have become one in fellowship with the father and the son. Uh, we're, we are living in love. Uh, we've come into the light. We have believed uh, the word that has come to us. Uh, all of these things are a part of overcoming the evil one because the only, the only desire of the devil is that we would lie to ourselves, lie to one another, uh, tear each other apart uh, by jealousy and hatred and all the things that just flow uh, from, from disobedience and rebellion. Uh, how do you overcome that? Well, you have to become obedient to the word. Brother Jim, is that not also an ongoing struggle? Sure it is. That's not a once once and done deal, right? In for me. <laughs> it's not for me either, Peggy. <laughs> I don't think anybody here is going to testify that they've, they've overcome the evil one and it's all said and done. and Shake the dust off their hands and good yeah. job. No, it's a, it's a daily deal. You know, I, I, I tell people all the time after something bad has happened, you know, I say, look, I know you didn't expect something like that to be said to you at church, or you didn't expect that to happen to you at church. But I always tell them, I say, believe me, the devil was the, the, the very first one who got to this church this morning after the Lord, the Lord was always here, but the devil came to tempt and cause trouble and disrupt things. Cause that's his business. That's he's going to keep doing that as long as he can. All right. Verse 15, do not love the world or anything in the world. Now he's, he's definitely talking to us just like John talked in his gospel. I mean, there's a dichotomy. I mean, you're, you're either uh, a part of God's kingdom or you're in the world, of the world. And, and if you're of the world, well, you're a worldly person. You're, you're in this world for all the things the world has to give. And, and that's it. That's, that's, where you, that's where your heart is. Uh, Jesus spoke about this many times. But if, if we are children of God, we're, we're part of another kingdom the things that, that are going to satisfy us are eternal things, life with God. Uh, we're not in it for the rewards that this life has uh, because they're passing away. We're, we're, in, we're in it for the eternal things and that eternal life that Jesus promised. So don't love the world or anything in the world because everything of this world is just things. And, and the world loves to run after what? Money? power, honor, uh, the, the things that can be gotten in this life, but, but none of those are, are going to pass on into eternity. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. Okay. So if you see me driving up in, in a $90,000 car tomorrow, you'll wonder whether I was really <laughs> in it for the money or I was, I was uh, being truthful about things, right? I mean, there's been plenty of uh, highly publicized pastors and evangelists in this world who, after it was all found out, were millionaires and they were taking the money from the church and, you know, they were, they were running around with all the women and et cetera and so on. And when they were found out, oh, oh, you know, woe on them. Uh, because the truth of the matter was they might have been sorry about it, but were they ever really apart with God? No, probably not. Uh, they might have been tempted once, but it sounds like they were tempted every day and they were willing to give in every day. Verse 16, for everything in the world, the cravings of the sinful man, the lust of his eyes and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the father, but from the world. And we know who the prince of the world is, right? Yep. Yeah. And until that day that uh, one word strikes him down, uh, boy, the devil, he's still, he's still loose and he's still causing trouble here. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. So again, 
we're investing our lives, not in the world. We're investing our lives in the eternal things that God will bring to pass. Uh, that's that eternal life. That is uh, uh, the things that will stay, the things that matter. Uh, and when we, we read out of uh, 1 Corinthians 13, and we get to that 13th verse where the, the Apostle Paul sums up for the church the things that are going to remain, the things that will abide, he says, these three things remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. <laughs> Yeah, that's that stuff that's eternal. Uh, that's stuff that's going to last. I mean, we get some hope here; it's going to last. You know, we we get love here; that that lasts because it comes from God and it's a part of us now. Uh, and and faith, well, that comes from God too. The Ephesians two, chapter, verse eight says, you know, that uh, this was a gift of God, so that no no one of us is going to boast about it. It's eternal too. It, it's, it's accepting the truth, recognizing the truth, coming into the light. There's so many ways to get wrapped right back around to where John is going with, with these themes here. Uh, and, and none of them are contradictory. They all lead to the same point. They're just different ways of talking about it to get there. All right. We've just, we've just talked around in circles about that. We can go a few more verses. Y'all are going to have to tell me again, uh, Mark, and help me and tell me where we pick up because we've only got a few minutes, minutes more. And he's going to start a whole new subject right here with the next verse. And maybe this can just be an introduction so that we come back to it next week and, and talk more about this. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, many, many antichrists have come. This is how we know it's the last hour. Well, that's a uh, that's an apocalyptic view. That's an apocalyptic view of life. Now, that's only one way to look at life, but John wants us to look with him in, in that avenue for a moment anyway, so that we'll put things in perspective. Uh, I mean, I don't read a whole, whole lot of stuff very literally when I get to the book of Revelation, because a lot of it is symbolism. A lot of it is uh, out of this whole genre of apocalyptic literature, but it's given for a reason. It's because, hey, we're in this life and we're going through hard times. And sometimes it's even harder than we thought it was going to be. And, and there's going to be people to tempt us and tell us that this is nonsense that you've been taught. Uh, you need to straighten your life out and do, do something right for yourself right now, because, uh, that, that was just a big mistake you made, uh, this well, and not, in Jesus Christ. Yes. What? Not only that, but we don't know that we even have tomorrow. That's correct. <laughs> and, and, and that's one of the things I always say when we talk about the end times, John's kind of talking about end times right here, last days, last hour. I mean, our last personal life hours. Yeah. Well, this, this is not John being proved wrong because now we're 2000 years beyond when he wrote this saying, well, John, look here. It wasn't the last hour. Like you thought it was. No, no, I'm agreeing. I'm agreeing with John because what he's saying is all held in this idea of, of this apocalypse, which, which means when things go out of control for you, well, when is that going to happen? Well, I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a day when your life goes out of control for you and there's no pulling it back. It, you're, you're just swirling into chaos. And maybe it's because of a physical infirmity or your mind just won't hold together anymore. I don't know what it is, but there's going to be a day of, of darkness for every one of us. But we need to know that beyond that is light and hope because God's going to deliver us from that moment. And that's the apocalyptic hope that we, that we, we live in. He, he's just telling us here though, there's going to be a lot of people to try to tempt you along the way. There's going to be antichrist. Anybody who speaks against God's word is an antichrist. I don't care if they're a man or a woman. It's they're, they're trying to take you away from the truth. They're trying to pull you back into the darkness. So when, when it gets to be the last hour, hang on, 
there's hope, there's hope and there's help coming. Uh, and uh, so, so be careful. He's, he's again telling us, dear children. And why would he say dear children? Because the amount of knowledge that we have and the depth of our knowledge about God and the things that are arrayed against us in this world are minuscule to what God understands and what Jesus knew. Uh, he, he just wants to get us through this hour of danger to safety again. And, and so he's writing in, from his heart right here, trying to help us because he knows that hour, that day, it's coming. And uh, we can be prepared for it. We can rest in the faith that we've been given through Jesus Christ. All right, that's quite an introduction. Does that does that does that help a little bit? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I, it's I'm always getting, I'm not it's getting all, response. It's always good to hear the word. It is, and sometimes, sometimes just just knowing that God's behind even the bad news is good for us. Uh, He's just, he's cautioning us not to give in because the forces are seemingly arrayed against us. All right. I've got 652 on my clock. That's usually about the time that I start wrapping up right here so that uh, we get ready for next time. So we'll, we'll cut back in about verse 18 and 19 and do that again next week as, as a shorter introduction, I hope to this whole theme of this, this warning against people who are breaking the church up and trying to break our faith down uh, cause that's an ongoing thing. It's in every generation. Uh, and it's a, it's a part of this. All right. Somebody, any, anybody else have comments? Uh, yes. Um, Jim, I just found out one of my granddaughters in Conway, uh, her, her husband and two kids have the COVID virus. Oh my. And they've just been diagnosed. Yes, apparently just the last few days. No, no one is hospitalized at this point. No. Okay. No. They're at home. And now this is who to you now? Which, what relation? It's, it's Betsy's daughter. Okay. My granddaughter. Okay. Well, will somebody uh, pray us out, but also pray a prayer for Betsy and her family in, uh, just, just ask for God's grace and protection over them in this in this illness. I'll pray us out. Thank you, Peggy. Father God, we do thank you for this time in your word and being able to gather uh, over the internet and having the ability to use that technology. We thank you for our election that happened yesterday and we just trust that you are in control, that whatever happens in the coming four years, um, it'll work out and uh, we can just rest in that assurance. Um, I give you praise for the Durbin's uh, daughter and son-in-law who was in intensive care and with the COVID and he is now home and we just are so thankful for that and, and for their recovery and for all of those who are healing from surgeries uh, I think of Sandra Rollins and I think of Ron Merritt and others. Uh, we just, just give you all the praise for healing. And we ask that you be with Buster's grandchildren and their family and just keep the symptoms minimal. Uh, please help them to fight this infection off with your, with your healing hand on them. Thank you for Brother Jim and, and for all of our congregation. And thank you for is is reaching out and searching ways to minister to this congregation as we go through this COVID. And he's done a great job and we are just so grateful for him. Thank you, Lord, and praise you and be with us throughout this evening. Thank you, Peggy. I appreciate that. And uh, Buster will continue to pray for Betsy and her family and Woo, mercy. I tell you what, we're not, we're not through this thing yet. And uh, it's going to be, it's going to be a long ways, I'm afraid. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful for everybody's faithfulness to uh, 
work together and, and do things like this Bible study over the internet. Uh, we'll just do the best we can till we can do better. Uh, but at, at least we're, we're doing what we can do in love and taking care of one another and, and not sharing illness. So uh, I'm thankful for our fellowship groups. I know many of you are a part uh, of a fellowship group and uh, they are, they are truly blessings to those who attend and, and pray together and uh, study together and, and do devotions. They're, they're an important part of our continuing fellowship as we get through this. So uh, I, th I think I'm thankful that our groups are, are working and, and striving uh, to, to hold our connection together. Um, well, Brother Jim, I'm serious about the, your, I, I call it reimagining uh, yeah. worship because you really have. I mean, you have just really stretched the limits using technology and whatever things that you can imagine to keep the congregation. That's cohesive. called that, that's called desperation with a, a, a touch of inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> All right. Thank you all so much for studying tonight. And uh, we'll join together back again in uh, chapter two and uh, and move on. Uh, I tell you, first, second, third John are, are so rich uh, with information for us. And, and I look forward to our study together. Y'all have a good Jim. weekend. Be, hey, we will be outside uh, for worship on Sunday. It looks like the weather is going to be good enough. The temperature is going to be nice. Uh, so I hope to see all y'all as much as we can and share the word with others, too to join us down at Merritt Park. Okay, Brother Jim, one real quick thing. Um, it occurred to me, and I wasn't gonna talk tonight, I was just gonna unmute me and be quiet, but I couldn't help it. But why did John, and you can tell us next week if you, if you can figure out what it is, and you may know already, you know, in the gospel, he just he just refers to himself as the, the disciple that Jesus loved. Wow. But here he's saying he's an elder. Now, why would be the difference? I'll leave that with you. Okay, we can talk about that. I've, I've read okay. some about that, and, and we'll, we'll get everybody to tune back in and talk about that. Okay. All right. Thank, a lot. Thank you all a lot. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, Good night everybody. <sighs>